Hey everyone, and welcome to your Linux, open source and privacy news fix for the end of April. This time we have the release of Ubuntu 21.04, graphical Linux applications running on Windows, Discord refusing to be bought by Microsoft, and a good-looking potential new Linux tablet. Let's take a look right after this. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is the largest independent cloud service provider, meaning they provide hosting that you can use to run your own servers, whatever you need one for. I use Linode to host my own Nextcloud instance, but thanks to their one-click apps, you can deploy any type of server in, well, in one click. If you're a gamer, you can easily start your own Valheim, Minecraft or CSGO server. But if you're looking for a VPN, you can also one-click deploy your own using WireGuard or OpenVPN, and you can ensure there is no middleman trying to intercept what you're connecting to. Linode is affordable and has consistent pricing with data centers all over the globe. You can upgrade your servers in one click, just as I did on my Nextcloud instance to add more storage, and you have real humans behind it all to talk to 24-7 by phone or support ticket, even if you use the cheapest plan available, which is $5 a month, by the way. They also have very detailed documentation if you don't like talking to other human beings, which I know I'm not a fan of. If you use the link in the description to sign up, you get a $100 credit to use on your own servers, so head over there and give it a go. I am certain you won't regret it. Okay, beginning with the Linux news, and the University of Minnesota has been banned from contributing to the Linux kernel for sending buggy patches for research purposes. They had worked on a paper called On the Feasibility of Stealthily Introducing Vulnerabilities in Open Source Software via Hypocrite Comets, and this was considered ethical experimenting. Except that after that research was complete, they kept sending in other patches that were obviously incorrect. The university defended itself, saying that these patches were the result of a new static analyzer tool, but that didn't fly well with Greg Crow Hartman, one of the head maintainers of the Linux kernel, who decided to ban the university from contributing again and remove, or at least review, all previous patches made by that entity. The University of Minnesota has since published an apology statement, which prompted additional requests for data about all previously submitted patches, to help check what was made in good faith and what was intentionally bad in the goal of advancing the university's research. The university seems to have answered these requests, so let's hope that they can hash it out and make peace. Ubuntu 21.04 Hirsute Hippo was released, and while it's not the biggest version Ubuntu has ever seen, it still packs a few features. The big missing piece here is GNOME 40, as Ubuntu didn't feel they had time to work on an adapted Yaru theme and on their extensions, so they decided to stick to GNOME 3.38 for this one. Still, there are new icons, a lightly updated look and feel, Wayland and Pipewire by default, and a more complete desktop icons implementation with drag and drop support. It also updates the internals, but we'll probably have to wait for the next one in 6 months to really see some more changes, including the new installer written in Flutter, and, let's hope, a good implementation of a full GNOME 40 or GNOME 41 if that's what the next version will be called. I have a video recapping all the changes, you can check it out in the card up top. Microsoft showcased Linux apps running on Windows through the Windows subsystem for Linux in all their graphical glory. They demoed a text editor as well as Audacity, and they do look and feel just like they do on Linux. The implementation isn't half-baked, as you get real GTK styling for GTK apps, drop shadows on the Windows, support for audio and microphone, and more importantly, support for GPU accelerated graphics. So technically, you could use it to run Steam and a Steam game in its Linux version right from your Windows device if you wanted. You probably even could run a Windows game running with Proton on the Linux version of Steam running on Windows. That's kind of a brain melter right there, but the real world implications are that developers should now be able to develop multi platform apps from an OS they know, namely Windows and test their Linux version without too much trouble. I think it's pretty cool. Version 5.12 of the Linux kernel was released, and it's called a small release by Linus Torvalds himself. Still, it adds support for a bunch new platforms, including the Nintendo 64, its game controllers and game cartridges, as well as for the DualSense, the PS5 controller. This contribution was actually made by Sony, which is nice. 
Intel's Adaptive Sync technology, which should help remove tearing and stuttering on 10th gen or higher Intel graphics, was also added to the kernel. A new subsystem has also been implemented to support dynamic thermal power management. This should allow to limit the power some devices use to stay within a thermal limit. A few obsolete platforms have also been removed, mostly 32-bit ARM-based ones, since they had no users. If you want more details, I added the link to the Kernel Newbies release page to the description of the video, as well as the OMG Ubuntu link used to illustrate this article. Plasma Mobile has received a big update to a lot of its default apps, and is seeing a bunch of new ones coming in as well, including the first steps for a mobile-enabled email client, which was a big missing part of the experience. Colibri, as it's named, still can only read messages, but an email composer is in the works. Other changes include hardware acceleration in the Angelfish browser, a new KeyPass compatible password manager, a few applications moving some interface components to use drawers on mobile, which will make using them a lot easier with only one hand, and the notifications and quick settings panel that you can pull down from the top of the screen, which now works much like on Android with a two-stage approach. One poll for quick settings and notifications, and a second poll to show more options. It's good to see Plasma Mobile expanding that fast, and developers working on new applications. It's a really promising Linux mobile shell. I covered it in a previous video, check the card up top to know more. Now let's talk a little bit about applications. Firefox 88 was released, and it seems to remove as many features as it's adding, on the new stuff side, we have smooth pinch to zoom using a touchpad on Linux, which is fantastic as an addition and will make using Firefox a lot more pleasant on laptops. And we also have the PDF viewer, which now supports JavaScript controls when you're filling out forms, which is also pretty good as JavaScript is often added to verify that the input in a given field is correct. Now, on the it's not there anymore side, we have FTP support being disabled from Firefox. The main reason seems to be that it's not a very secure protocol, as it's not encrypted. I guess most people relying on FTP were using a dedicated client, but still. The take screenshot action is also removed from the contextual right-click menu, which sucks big time as it's what I used to take screenshots of web pages for these Linux news videos. The feature is still there, accessible in the little three-dot menu in the URL bar, but that poor little scissors icon didn't hurt anyone in the context menu, why remove it? Discord was talking with Microsoft about a potential buy, but it seems that this won't happen. Microsoft was allegedly interested to buy the messaging and communication tool for up to $10 billion, but it seems Discord would like to expand on their own as a standalone company. The fact that the current pandemic has bolstered user numbers like crazy is probably one of the main reasons why Discord didn't take the easy way out, and since the rumors were also facing a bit of backlash by users, they might have decided that it was better to keep going on their own. Anyways, it seems like Discord won't join the Redmond-based giant for now, so if that was something you really didn't want to see happen, you can breathe a nice sigh of relief. Geary40 was released, and this GDK-based mail client is getting really good these days. The new release brings a responsive user interface, which means that Geary will make an excellent candidate for default mail client on Fosh and other Linux mobile platforms. The layout of the handlebar has changed a bit to accommodate these changes, and you'll also now get to write new emails in a separate window if you like. There is also a new sidebar, much more GNOME-like than the previous and easier to read. Unfortunately, the individual panes aren't individually resizable anymore, which means that the window size will determine the layout of the client. That might end up being annoying in some cases. Still, if you're using a GDK-based desktop, Geary is probably your best bet for a simple mail client. I'm almost tempted to use it on KDE instead of Kmail. KDLive 21.04 was released and it packs a lot of new features. First, it now supports text-to-speech in 17 different languages to generate subtitles automatically, which is a pretty awesome feature. Or maybe it's speech-to-text? Not really sure. The timeline also looks a lot better, especially with annotations and guides. There is a new media browser to drag and drop clips and images directly to your project, and interacting with keyframes is now a lot easier, since you can select multiple keyframes at the same time and move them all at once. A new typewriter effect has also been added to make text appear more naturally, 
and you can create effect zones that will apply an effect to an entire section of the timeline instead of a selected clip, which should speed up a few editing operations. Finally, there is an online resource browser that will let you download stock footage from Pexels or Pixabay and will add attribution data to your project's notes. The team also squashed 500 bugs since the previous release. Get Alive is an amazing project that I can't wait to go back to once it has stable hardware acceleration. Now, on the Linux hardware front, you probably have heard about Jing OS, the tablet-focused Linux-based OS coming from a relatively new Chinese company. Well, these guys want some nice flagship hardware to accompany that new distro, and they are launching a crowdfunding campaign for the JingPad A1, an iPad Pro clone, at least in terms of look and feel, with 128GB of storage, 6GB of RAM, and an octocore CPU. It will, of course, run Jing OS and will have an optional magnetically attached keyboard and a stylus to match. There is no word yet on pricing, and there only seems to be renders of the actual device itself, but I will definitely sink my money into this, because having a really good tablet experience that can run Android apps out of the box and uses Linux behind the scenes has been a dream for a while now, at least for me. We'll have to see how it goes, but I'm definitely excited. Now in terms of gaming, we have Wine 6.7, which was released, with a few new features. More DLL files were converted to the PE format, and the Media Foundation has seen even more work. The drivers that handle plug-and-play peripherals have also received some attention, and 44 bugs have been fixed in this release, including for Bioshock Remastered, Legends of Runeterra, the Origin Game Launcher, or Supreme Commander. VKD3D 2.3 was released. The DirectX 12 to Vulkan conversion layer gains now support for DirectX ray tracing, but only for NVIDIA drivers for now. They say that, for now, Ghost Runner and Control should work with it, but they haven't tested much more than this. It's still exciting, as it means that we will get feature parity soon with Windows on the most recent games, including DLSS and ray tracing, which are a big help when gaming at higher resolutions. Now, other improvements in this version include a 20% performance boost on NVIDIA GPUs for Resident Evil 2 and greatly improved performance on many titles, especially Horizon Zero Dawn and Death Stranding. A small patch was released a few days afterwards to fix a few issues. This new release has been included in Proton Experimental as well. And to round up this video with some privacy news, WordPress announced that they would like to auto-block the new Google-designed tracking method called Flock, Federated Learning of Cohorts. It seems like WordPress thinks that this method is a security concern, and they're proposing to send, in future version 5.8, a header indicating that they don't want to support that technology. WordPress powers, according to them, 41% of the web right now, so if that change is agreed upon, and I have little doubt it will, it means that Google's new tracking method could lose a lot in terms of efficiency. That is, if people actually updated their WordPress version, which isn't the case for a lot of websites. Admins that still want to opt into Flock will be able to revert that change and remove the four lines of code. I already covered this new tracking method in a dedicated video a few weeks ago. Check out the card up top to know more. And that's it for this news video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, don't hesitate to like or dislike if you didn't. You can also subscribe and turn on notifications to get more videos like this one. And if you want to watch somewhere else than on YouTube, I'm also on Odyssey. I left a link in the description below. Now you can also join my amazing Patreon subscribers and YouTube members if you want to help support the channel financially, and you'll get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. Now thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!